Please help spread the message of Frequency Specific Microcurrent by clicking on the like button. You can subscribe to us on YouTube or any podcast app. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. You can find the podcast transcription at FrequencySpecific.com, as well as more information about Frequency Specific Microcurrent. Three o'clock straight up. So we're not delayed. We're right on time, which is a little unusual. Yeah, normally we're a little before, a little after. And it's so funny that you start by saying that because those of you who have been following me on Instagram, I've been taking this mindset and mental well-being course to help talk with patients and clients and it helps keep them positive and it works with visualization and symbolism. And it's been a very intensive 12-week course because oh, everyone- wow assignment and you get to write about it and there's a a group online and you read each other's essays and you collaborate and one of the messages in the latest videos was you are right on time always I always think we're always rushing we're always trying to rush through a treatment or we're trying to rush through the process and you can't do that nope It's what you need shows up. It just doesn't always look like what you thought it was going to look like. That is one of my favorite Carolisms. Yeah, it's my favorite role because it's always true. I had a patient in the last week, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, came in with cervical trauma, fibro, pain diagram, and nobody had ever told her that it came from the disc in her neck. And her timeline history was like made the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Nobody could have that much bad stuff happen. She came in at a six, ran 40 and 10 and TTH. And she left at a three and didn't comment on the difference. Came back the second day, very emotional, very agitated we ran 40 and 10 again her pain was back to a six it went back to a three then she showed me her mri and she's had both hips replaced and in her cervical mri is this disc bulge at five six that is right in the middle of her spinal cord her spinal cord is peanut shaped instead of round and friday i said I am ethically obliged to tell you that your neck needs surgery. She's, I am not having another surgery. Patient said. That's like, what the patient said. No more surgeries. I've had two hips, two knees. I'm so done. Monday, she came in and her pain had stayed down over the weekend. So by Monday, she came in expecting it to go down. Monday, I gave her a custom care, she used it, came in Tuesday afternoon. Pain level was mostly in her low back. The full body pain was gone. Low back pain, because she's doing a exercise at the gym that is bad for lumbar discs. Let's find a different way to strengthen your quads. And then she said, so do you know it? good neurosurgeon and I said the guy that did my surgery has retired I have the name of the lady that replaced him but you have good connections start asking around and find somebody that's good that you trust and it'll help the tightness in your legs and it'll help your body pain so by the time she left Tuesday she went from I'm not having another surgery, I don't care, to now I just have to get used to having my pain out of four. That was incomprehensible. And do you know a good neurosurgeon? So I was really glad I didn't give up on her. And I think it takes a lot for you to give up on a patient, just knowing you and knowing the type of people who have so many other practitioners have given up on them or dissuaded them or dismiss them or whatever by the time they come to you they've been through a lot yeah and the fact that somebody could look at her mri see one beat of clonus and an equivocal babinski 
like her toes went down, but her big toe went up. Oops. Yeah. And look at that disc and not say anything about it. I, How is that? I don't know. You can't badmouth another practitioner. It's the last doctor that saw you that looked at this MRI and didn't tell you. You can't say something bad about him. So all I could say was, I am ethically required to tell you that your neck is surgical, that your spinal cord is deformed. This is dangerous. And here's one thing I want to unpack before you go any further, because I've had emails about this. And so it was, how are you tying what's happening to the neck to leg tightness? Oh, okay. Yeah, that part's easy. It's easy, but it's not an immediate thought process for a lot of people. So no. I'd like you to unpack that part first before you go. Part of the reason that I know about it is my own medical history. So I had a disc bulge that was broad-based, gave me weakness and fuzzy feeling and pain in my fingers and worked six months with FSM and physical therapy and got it healed. No pain, good motion, all that. Then I lifted something really heavy middle or end of October. And starting the next day, I couldn't move the left side of my body. It's interesting. And then my left leg was just really tight. My lumbar spine was really tight on the left. The disc bulge was on the right. <clears throat> so I had another MRI after I had a positive Babinski. I had another MRI. And then I had a friend of mine check my Babinski on a Wednesday in San Francisco. And it was floridly positive on the left. My left leg was really tight and weak. And um, I looked at the MRI again and at the cross section, the disc had herniated when I lifted that thing in October. It had herniated right into the center of the spinal cord. So when you look at Netter, the sensory pathways in the cord are on, on the anterolateral side, they're on the sides. The motor pathways are in the middle. So if a disc bulge herniates into the middle of the cord, you end up with tightness and weakness in your trunk, in your legs. Usually it shows up in the legs and I found out from treating myself because the disc had been in the middle of my spinal cord and basically demyelinated the motor pathways. My left leg was tight even after the surgery. So I thought, I wonder, and I'd used it in transverse myelitis before. 40 and 10 got rid of the body pain, but it made the spasticity worse on a transverse myelitis patient. So I ran 81 and 10 and the muscles relaxed, but the pain came back. So I ended up having to run both 40 and 10 for the body pain and 81 increase secretions in the cord on this transverse myelitis patient, like in 2000, I don't know, six, five, someplace like that. So I had it buried in the, was in the junk drawer in your brain. Right. And so when my leg was tight, I put it together with the disc bulge in the middle, in the center. And you look at Netter and there's those little motor pathways. They send descending motor activation signals, but those motor pathways also send descending messages that say do not spasm so one of the symptoms of ms is an ataxic gait there's spasticity involved you run 81 and 10 and it goes away on myself i ran 81 and increased secretions in the spinal cord and it goes away 
So when Jay Shaw was at the advance a couple of years ago, we had a practitioner that had like spastic hamstrings and quads, like he couldn't straighten his legs and his patellar reflexes were plus three. And I said, hey, Jay, look at this, feel his quads. Okay. I ran 81 and 10. And then, I don't know, it takes about 30 minutes. The legs softened up the front and then up the back. I don't know why it happens in that order, but it just always does. Okay. And then Jay did his reflexes. They were normal. And the tone relaxed so he could straighten his knees. And I turned to Jay Shaw, who is the external hard drive for neurotransmitters. And it's like, what are we doing? He said, I have no idea. And I said, that has to be GABA, right? Because GABA is what relaxes muscles. However, dopamine is also what allows contraction of the muscles. So increased secretions in the spinal cord is doing one or both of them. Because otherwise, how is it we're relaxing spasticity? Right. So when somebody comes in with hyperactive patellar reflexes and full body pain, it's something in the cervical spine or the thoracic spine. It has to be where there is a spinal cord to make the patellar reflexes plus three. And when they come in with really tight legs and hyperactive reflexes. In our world, you run 40 and 10 to quiet down the hyperactive reflexes, reduce inflammation and literally inflammation in the cord. And then you increase secretions in the cord to relax the tone. So that concept of increased tone nobody looks for it because they don't have a way to treat it. As a physical therapist, you're not going to hand a patient 20 milligrams of baclofen and say, I'll come work with you in half an hour. But as a physical therapist who does FSM, you can run 81 and 10 and relax the spasticity. Or in the case of the other patient I saw this week, she had no motor. She had no hip flexors, like she couldn't raise her knee, she was plus three, couldn't straighten her leg, dorsiflex, plantar flex, quads, hamstrings were all plus three, couldn't hold against any pressure. She could raise them against gravity, but not hold against pressure. So maybe that's a minus four. Anyway, mm -hmm. around 81 and 10, to increase motor signaling down the spinal cord. Yeah. She went to a plus five in 60 minutes. Right. Didn't hold. The second time I treated her, it held over the weekend. And she came in on Monday and said, now my low back hurts. And she said, and my butt muscles are sore. Yeah. This happened to you in 2005. <laughs> so you haven't walked. Yeah. You haven't used your butt muscles or extended your hip right. in 20 years. Oh, yeah. So we ran low back pain. And it has been a week of connecting the spinal cord and the extremities in different ways. One, to increase motor function yeah. and one, to reduce spasticity. Right. And it's the same Frequency combination, 81 and 10, increase motor doperacetylcholine mm -hmm. down the spinal cord to make her muscles contract for the first time in 20 years. Right. And the other one was 40 and 10 to quiet the pain, but 81 and 10 to relax the tightness in her legs. Yeah, I'm sure everybody who's not listening live, who is watching this on playback is just hitting, this is the time where you hit pause. And you're like, what did she just say? <laughs> Wait, what? Rewind.
And I do listen to us back a lot of times and I'll watch it to see how we're explaining things because I think sometimes we go on the riff and it's just, oh yeah, I was 81 and 10, then it was 40 and 10 and then specificity increased and then it was numb and then it was hyperesthetic and then it normalized and then blah, blah, blah. And then we're just talking like it's some recipe that we've made for 20 years blindfolded in the kitchen and yeah. It, but it wasn't always like that. And I think what's helping a lot of practitioners out there, as far as what the feedback that I'm getting is learning how to think through the problem and always having that idea of, okay, yes, what is occurring and where is that occurring? That's the very basic A versus B channel. But the bigger question is always what happened? What happened first? Yes, I get it. It's scarred. But scarring doesn't happen overnight for no reason at all. Why did it get scarred? Oh, something was cut. Why was it cut? There was trauma. What happened in the trauma? It bled. And so when you start creating the narrative, it's not so scary. And because we have a tool that lets us change it in real time. Mm -hmm. Now, give me 60 minutes. And if I'm right, this will happen. And if I guessed wrong, That'll happen. Yeah. As far as I know, there's nobody else except for FSM practitioners that thinks this way about how the spinal cord works. Right. One of the practitioners that was at the core we did in May, whenever, June, sometime, May. A little while. Yeah. In Troutdale, he's an MD, he's a GP, he's, he's, subspecialty is neuropsychopharmacology. Oh. Yeah. So he and I were on the fibromyalgia circuit back in 2004 or five back there um, lecturing. And he's brilliant. He took the core and I got a text message from him three weeks later. And he said, I have ordered three cervical MRIs in the last two weeks based on reflexes and muscle tone. And I never would have done that before. And it's FSM practitioners, we have mileage, but we end up thinking about how the nervous system works differently than people that don't have FSM. Number one, because we can, and number one, because we have to. If you're going to fix it, you have to know what the tool is. I will never understand in this lifetime why or how it works unless I retire and get that PhD in neuroscience and play with a squid axon or the spinal cord of a mouse or a rat or something and find out what we're changing. You want to know what the exciting pieces are for me? I just have to interject really quickly because when you do something, when you get a condition with one patient and you have the hypothesis and it works, you feel great. And then you have another patient with the same condition and you put the same hypothesis on and then it works again. And then it works again. So that part in the book, when I think it's the book, when you start talking about things being reproducible, that to me gets so exciting and now that i'm teaching it when people who have taken the course like that thing that you showed us how to do what well, worked on the end okay it's not just me and it's not the room and it's not the skills that i have it's reproducible mm-hmm. and it took me like literally five years from 1990 actually as longer than that five years yeah to about 2002 we added up the number of patients I'd seen. I think it was 30,000 or 50,000 patient visits, 90 patients a week for five years to believe, to understand that without fail, the frequencies always do what they are described as doing. Back in the day when we first started and it didn't work, I told people they weren't hydrated enough. So now I have patients who come in who've had so much water that they get off the table and go to the bathroom twice. And it's, I'm really sorry, you guys. It wasn't that you weren't hydrated. It's that I was wrong. But after 
five years and let's say 30,000 patient visits, I understood that the frequencies always, once you know that they always do that. So I had a patient come in yesterday who'd been nauseated for, I don't know, since 2023 sometime. And then she had an auto accident and her nausea got worse. And her mom is a PT, brought the girl in and said, we think it's a vagus nerve traction injury. And I know you're treating the vagus nerve. Could you treat her? I put a pulse ox on the kid and their pulse was 78 or 80. And she, she runs hurdles in high school. Her resting pulse should not be 80. So I knew that we needed to treat the vagus. So I did the regular vagus, but then she said, I was nauseated before the accident. Really? What else happened in 2023? I got COVID. Okay. On a second machine manually, I ran each of the COVID virus frequencies with the vagus as a target tissue. And her resting pulse dropped to 62. Didn't change the nausea right away, but her color was better. She slept better. She wasn't as exhausted. Basically what she had was long COVID in the Vegas. And when she walked in the door, they told me that the auto accident created a traction injury in the vagus nerve. And then the kid happened to mention, I was nauseated before the accident too, mom. Oh, and it, so we get to think differently because we have a tool that lets us. And the other side of that is we have a tool that makes us. And I am guilty of saying the makes us forces us. I do feel sometimes that you are like backed into the corner and you're just like, okay, I have to think right now. And you want to just pause time and think. And <clears throat> that's a great time to pull out the netters or your software. I'm still very much a textbook girl in the clinic. So I pull out netters edition two. <laughs> And I show people, this is the area we're working on. And I want to just show them, especially when you're treating like tight hip flexors. And for those of you who are listening on the podcast, I'm doing bunny ears and Carol's rolling her eyes because it is never ever the psoas. No, I'm not saying the psoas doesn't get tight or it doesn't get attached to something or there's not scarring there. I'm not saying that I still don't treat hip flexor-ish type sure. conditions. Yes. But I have to show people what is on top of the hip flexor. Oh. First and foremost, for me, that is being, what did you say? How you, you had explained that you were professionally obligated to. Oh, I'm ethically <laughs> obliged. I feel like I am ethically obliged to tell you. And I have a lot of athletes that come in and say, oh, you need to get in there and release my hip flexor. Okay. Let me show you what's on top of your hip flexor because it attaches onto the ilium. Let me show you what's on top of the ilium. Ladies, you've got ovaries and fallopian tubes and there's organs and there's an omentum. And remember that time you fell flat on your back as you fell off the horse and you bruised your kidney? I didn't bruise my kidney. Was your back sore? Yeah. And then after that, my back, my, we're used to scarring on the ureter scarring in the kidney, sclerosis in the kidney fat pad, we're used to that causing psoas and QL tightness. Right. The thing that has surprised me in the last year is the number of times where, it, yeah, that works, but what really works is 81 and 10. When there's increased tone in the legs and you feel their quadratus lumborum and their psoas and their respiratory muscles and you run 81 and 10 to loosen their legs and then all of a sudden their back muscles loosen up mm -hmm. how long have I been doing this and it takes me 29 years to figure that out That's, so there's hope for us all <laughs> there's hope for all of you follow the breadcrumbs 
Right. And it's just thinking your way through that. So I'm going to go back to the hip flexor for a second. And if you show the patient all these organs, more often than not, that is going to trigger, oh, I actually had this. I had my appendix out or it was infected, or I did have a kidney infection. Oh, I remember that time when. And so sometimes seeing a picture of an organ can jog a memory of something, because again, especially for the manual therapist in the group or the trainers there, we're not patients and clients aren't used to disclosing that much information to you, even though they might think about it on the patient history form, who cares that I had my appendix out, who cares that I had all these ovarian cysts, who, right? Kidney stones or kidney stones. Exactly. (laughs) That for the practitioners listening, showing them a picture of organs in a very nice way, like in netters, where it's this very pretty can not only be patient education where, listen, I'm going to release your psoas, but look what's on top of that. But it helps to, again, the more information that you can gather, the better. And then if you still feel that you need to dig your hand in and go elbows deep into someone's psoas, you have a tool to help you soften the tissue so that you are not creating more scarring and thus more inflammation. Because again, I don't care how good your hands are. I have been trained and have seen the most amazing manual therapists. It is impossible to treat a deep muscle without some sort of collateral damage. I stand by that. Yep, absolutely. And the same idea, but I do it in the opposite order. The patient says, my hip flexors are really tight and I put my fingers on the psoas and they go, ah, that's it. It's so tight. And I put my fingers on the back and ah, that's it. It's so tight. And I went, okay. So technically we're just treating the psoas. So I put the frequency on for scarring and the ureter. I find that ah, jumpy spot, wait until it softens and then roll the ureter off the psoas and then go up and do the kidney fat pad. And I went, wow, that is really cool. What did you do? And I said, the frequencies I used are for scarring in the ureter. And then I get out netter. So I fix it first because otherwise they freak out thinking there's something actually wrong with their ureter and their kidney. Remember that time you fell off the horse? Did you ever fall flat on your back? Did you ever have a kidney infection? Did you ever have a kidney stone? No. There was that time I, so I treat first and explain later. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So it's just same thing, just different order. Right. And I mean, that's you being very confident and following the breadcrumbs and knowing what you need to treat. I'm saying Netter can be very helpful when you're completely stuck and lost and you need a little bit of inspiration. It's like when I pop on my reading glasses and I go through the laminate and someone's, don't you have that app that just tells you like what frequency to use? I'm like, yeah, but I'm just going to look at something here. And sometimes I am looking for inspiration. I'm looking for another idea because I don't know how this part happens, but the frequency that you need will all of a sudden just be like in bold print going, pick me. <laughs> Protein accumulation. What is that? I, and it's just, it stands out in bold print. Amazing. Or you, I'll, I'll do the same thing because I use the buddy yeah. all the time, but I actually went in and printed. Yeah. It, um, so again, there's no right or wrong way necessarily to attack a an idea or a hypothesis. Sometimes you are convinced it is scarring in the ureter. This is scarring in the nerve and you try it and you're like, it's not, I'm going to adapt. I'm going to pivot. And like I said, FSM teaches us so many things. And the first thing that always sticks out in my head is to be adaptable and be able to not take my hypothesis personally it was not a failure but fail is the first attempt in learning so my first shot wasn't quite right flexibility of mind yes yeah we have a couple questions both emailed and here I'm going to pull up I see Maddie is live on the chat and she had emailed us um, a case 
So I'm going to go ahead and open that up because it sounds pretty interesting about a dislocated patella, some hypermobility and pain not improving. That was the title. Oh, this is an email because Maddie's got a different thing. Okay. Yeah. She had emailed us, the, the, but we can, do, we can do the stuff on the Q&A here if you want. No, you do that one. What okay. was the deal? Okay. So the title is dislocated patella, hypermobility, pain not improving. This is a 14-year-old dislocated her patella laterally as she was struck playing netball. Nine okay. out of nine on Baton score, having trouble keeping her pain under an eight out of 10. Um, so the patella has some maltracking. She attached an MRI. I'll read some notes on that in a second. Worse in knee flexion to 40 degrees than extension. Glute med adductor, poor contraction. She is 170 pounds, 14, about five foot nine. Okay. Uh, Maddie had run concussion in Vegas. The external joint acute program, 124 on A, 77 on B. She has three custom cares. Pain comes down from an eight to a four. Her appointments are about an hour long. She was on crutches because she couldn't wait bear. Second session was a week later. Pain went up. She ran 40.89 as pain was also a nine. So her pain went up. Um, she ran trauma 124 and 40 in the bone capsule and fascia. She ran ligature laxity. Pain reduced in that treatment, but it wasn't maintained. Um, she's going to get a CT and her um, GP referred her to an orthopedic surgeon. She's wondering for suggestions. Um, 40 and 10, 81 and 10 did nothing. Maddie gave her some exercises for the VMO, some heel slides. She is refusing crutches now and will not go to school because the pain is so bad. Anything that jumps out at you right there? I'm yeah, she needs an MRI. Okay, so I'm reading the MRI results. ACL and PCL are intact. Right. Medial meniscus, medial compartment, articular cartilage, MCL are normal. Lateral side is also normal. Proximal tibiofibular joint, normal. No abnormality is present with the popliteal neurovascular structures. There is a patellar alta, so with a insol salvati ratio of 1.39. The patella is laterally placed in relation to the femoral trochlea. Um, slight lateral patellar tilting. Moderate bone marrow edema. Remind me to talk about bone marrow edema because well, it's like but magic. when you said her pain was nine out of nine, it's like she's got a bone bruise. That's the only thing that hurts that bad. Remind me to talk about this one. Okay. Bone marrow edema involved in the anterior lateral femoral condyle. Yep, that's the pain generator. That yeah. is such a pain. And then yeah, cartilage is intact. Yeah. Femoral attachment. Blah 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 blah. Oh, there's right. a previous high grain ligamentous strain injury. No significant a knee joint effusion, synovitis, loose body, or Baker's cyst. Yeah. You so. need to run acute fracture, Maddie, and hemorrhage, inflammation, and torn and broken in the bone parts. Bone marrow edema means bone bruise yeah. because bone marrow is in the middle, but in order to get the bone marrow inflamed, you've got to basically bust the bone. So yeah. you bruise the bone yes, and that kind of deep inside, don't put weight on me. Oh my God, pain. Maddie said I ran fracture twice with no change and 40 and 10. Okay. Hang on. I'm going to pull something up here because with athletes, you are going to see bone marrow edema. What, what's deep old bruise? 284? Yeah. In the bone. That so I've had the bone or the marrow in the marrow and in the bone. You know what else works? And I didn't think it would, but I've been three for three on it with bone marrow edema. What it's pain pressure 20. Oh, of course, I don't always go to it, but it is magic. So I've seen this with a MCL, it was a bone bruise hockey puck that creates a lot of bone marrow edema, and with shoulder dislocations, we see that. But 284 deep hole bruise can be very helpful in the bone marrow and in the bone. I'll have to pull this up for you, what frequency that is. It's 238. 238, thank you. The 284 in the bone marrow makes me a little nervous. Yes. 
because it's so well vascularized and that's where blood I, I would run that only on 59 and 39. Right. Yes. Okay. Bone marrow makes me nervous. Absolutely. But 20 in the bone marrow, right? Yes. That makes perfect sense. Pressure it, in the bone marrow. Like I said, when you have an athlete that has that much pain that it is excruciating and it's not coming down, bone marrow edema is extremely exquisitely painful. So when we see shoulder dislocations, we'll see that in the MRI right away. And with shoulder dislocations, you're thinking about all the ligature that is torn and you run that and the pain doesn't go anywhere. I don't need an MRI. I try those frequencies right off the bat. Pain comes down. Yeah. No. As you said, the yes. pain stayed up. It had to be the bone marrow or a bone bruise. Right. The other piece of it is she's 14 and an athlete and hypermobile. Yeah. So I don't know. Teenagers, it's a thing. It, there's just a lot more emotional response to being injured, never been injured before. By the time you're my age, you're used to getting busted up and getting used to the recovery process, getting the pain down. Well done. Yes. The concussion protocol can be very helpful in tandem with this, because like you said, there is a to no fault of their own, a deep psychological sense of panic, especially if they are a high level athlete. Sometimes they have all this pressure on them. So they have pressure from the bone marrow edema, but they also have pressure coming at them from teachers and parents and themselves. And you have to get better, you have to get better, get out of pain, suck it up. There's a big narrative around that. So you do have the shock and the trauma of the accident or the injury that happened, but there are so many other components that are attached to treating teenagers that we have to be aware Maybe of. Maybe we can have Burke or Catholic do a, a presentation about this because my experience with teenagers, it comes down to, they don't know who they are yet. Yeah. They're still inventing themselves as adults. So they start out as kids and the aliens come and the hormones come when you're 11 or so. And you spend your adolescence figuring out who you are mm -hmm. and creating an adult self or the beginning of an adult self. And so the emotional reaction to injury or pain when they're teens it affects their identity in a way that you don't see. And adults right. have an identity and they get injured. Yes. For a teenager, they're working on an identity and now their identity is I'm in pain and I'm injured. And that's terrifying. Absolutely. You think that's correct? I just I, made that up. No, 100%. As a mom of three teenage athletes who treats not only my kids, but all my kids' friends and the rest of the neighborhood. Yeah, you do absolutely see that. And as much as you try to tell them, so with my kids, they play hockey. They say, I'm a hockey player. I'm like, no, you play hockey. Hockey is what you play. You that are not who you are. Right. So trying to split that apart can be very difficult. Again, depending on all these external factors. So we talk about that in the core when we your, the analogy was, if you've ever tried to put a Band-Aid on a screaming three-year-old, you understand this concept. So the nervous tension can also be very helpful to run if you have multiple machines running um, in tandem with what you are objectively seeing on the MRI. Those of you who came to the podcast when I had Charlie Weingroff on, he, he always talks about he sees things in bubbles or in rings and you have the subjective findings, what the patient, what that patient's energy is bringing to the treatment. And you have the objective findings, what you are reading on their x-rays and MRIs. But then you have that middle ring of the subjective, the objective and the present. And I always think about that ring of, well, that's a good idea. Yeah. It's a really nice blend because, um, there's another orthopedic surgeon that's fantastic on Instagram and I'll, I'll pull his name up right away for an orthopedic surgeon. He 
does not like to operate a ton. And so he will say, I understand your knee is bone on bone, but that doesn't mean you need to have pain. So sometimes the imaging doesn't match the subjective findings. It's somewhere in the middle, that middle ring or that middle bubble that we need to focus our attention on. It's the same thing with patients who have exquisite pain and, or they have a terrible x-ray and no pain at all. So you have to find that middle ground. Yeah. And they've found that everybody gets injured. We just get beat up as we go along and do yeah. stuff. And you either heal with inflammation or heal without inflammation. So the patients that have terrible looking x-rays at the age of 70 and yeah. no pain, those are the ones that healed without inflammation. Right. The patients that have not so bad x-rays, but exquisite facet pain or joint pain, they healed their always with inflammation. And when you think about the vagus nerve, its job is to suppress inflammation. Right. So that's when you go looking for what was your diet like? What was going on in your life? Mm -hmm. That's where the the timeline comes in. Right. So if you're 67 and you were in an abusive environment from the age of three, your vagus nerve has been downregulated for 34 years. And so it makes sense that your low back is really painful or your knees or whatever. Before I forget the Instagram doctor, his name is Dr. Howard Lux and his handle is H-J-L-U-K-S-1, H-J-L-U-K-S-1, Dr. Howard Lux. Amazing. He puts very cool images on and quotes and things. So like I said, I think it's important that we do get imaging. Like we started the podcast talking about the importance of getting the whole story but having the ability to see what's in front of you, listen to the patient and That's imaging and physical exam. Yes. And the patient story about what's going on with them, their idea about it. Yes. And if you are about to prove them wrong, you have to do that very carefully because patients are pretty attached my body pain is all inflammation. Okay. I, and then you run 40 and 10 and it's, oh, it's actually inflammation in your spinal cord. And, but they don't care as long as they're out of pain. Working arrests the whole psychology of recovery is not getting them to working with the patient to change their story about their pain right. or their injury. Yes. Okay. We have a lot on the Q&A and the chat. Do. Where do you want to start? I'll let you. Let me start with ALF because it's up there on the q and I'd appreciate feedback. I apologize to the non-doctors for some of the terms that I'll be using in regards to sleep apnea. Perfect. Many factors which can contribute obstructive factors neurologically, some can key influencers with involuntary breathing on the primary motor cerebral cortex. I might argue with that one, Elf. Breathing is starts in the medulla. Anyway, there's voluntary breathing, primary motor cortex. I'll go with that one. Involuntary is the medulla. But anyway, working in conjunction with the brainstem. Yes, respiratory centers. Thank you very much. I just had to get there. Pneumotoxic center, apneistics in the medulla, pons along with the thalamus, cranial nerves, blah, blah, blah. What do you think it would be worth trying? 49 and the pons and the hypothalamus, the medulla, the brainstem, vagus, carotid bodies. Yeah. And if there were prior brain injuries, whiplash, acceleration, de deceleration. So then you have axonal, long axon injuries when you whip your head forward and backwards. So the axons that go through the medulla up into the brain get tractioned. Look into the concussion protocol and 124 on the above tissues before using 49. 
that is all worthwhile. And anybody that has been in the core or the advanced has heard me go off about sleep apnea. I don't treat fatal conditions. And sleep apnea is a fatal condition. I don't want to wear a CPAP. Okay, how do you feel about having dying at two o'clock in the morning from a stroke or a heart attack? Now, when it comes to patient conditions, we I'm usually easy, come at it easy and sideways. People take sleep apnea, just blow it off as a no-brainer, as a no big deal. And there's this book called The Promise of Sleep mm -hmm. that describes what sleep apnea does. Everybody with hypertension that takes more than two medications needs a sleep study. Mm -hmm. And because when you're apneic, your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up, your oxygen saturation goes down. And you can do that three to six times an hour or a minute. That's just nuts. So yes, Alf, I'd say that's actually a really good idea as long as it's not mechanically obstructive. Mm -hmm. There's neurologic sleep apnea. We have tools for that, but you need to make sure that the patient is safe. I'm happy to treat this lady's pain, but yeah. I need, I'm need i ethically obliged to tell you that you are at extremely elevated risk for heart attack and stroke as long as you are not wearing a CPAP. Right. And that there's that. And once they're safe, then the neurologic stuff, that's really a good way of looking at it. Would you like to present a case report, Alf? The symposium is coming up for everybody that's listening. I'm starting to recruit case report presentations, 30 minutes, 20 to 25 slides. Um, magic. Yes. Okay. You want to take Cynthia? I, I do. There is a big one that was jumping out that was missing. Okay. Cynthia saw a 16-year-old male hockey player need at full speed on his right mid thigh 10 days ago. So those of you who don't follow hockey, there's no padding on the mid thigh. There's just, or there is padding, but there's nothing like hard there. It's just like nothing. So he's hit mid thigh. So soft tissue, he's got pain. He's supposed to try out for a national team on Tuesday. She had used 40, 124 and 284 on a 77 142, 62, 783, and B. So she was running inflammation, torn and broken, deep old bruise on the connective tissue, fascia, muscle, and periosteum. Yep, good start. She ran concussion in Vegas, soft tissue, one to four, two precision care supporting. So the question was, do I start deeper at the surface? I I am seeing some something like blatantly missing from, from the formula first. And I don't think it really matters about deep or superficial, but there was trauma and there was bleeding. So that is what happened. And until you address the bleeding, that's like the basics that we see, the 40 and the 284 aren't gonna do much. So the tissue is torn and broken. So 124 is going to be the one that's gonna help. That's what's going to help settle everything down, but it's bleeding the quadriceps bleeds. You get a big bruise, the quadriceps, there's four muscles in the anterior thigh. They are all going to tighten up. I think you should treat the nerve as well because the quads are going to do what we say is splint or guard. So that's why he's getting that ache five seconds post muscle contraction, because the nerve is holding on for dear life. Carol has and a not just femoral nerve. If you look at the quads, you have a crutch injury to the whole femoral plexus. It runs between the adductors and the quadriceps. So the only thing missing from the formula is maybe the nerve. Yeah. It's too soon, even at 10 days, for the nerve to be adhered. Yeah. But 40 in the nerve would be worth running since you have multiple machines. And bleeding. And bleeding. Yeah. yeah. You contract the muscle. And if the blood vessels are still crushed and the capillaries are still crushed, you contract the muscle and it increases the vascular pressure and it bleeds, yeah. maybe. Yes. Uh, yeah, I would put bleeding into your A channel. I would put nerve into your B channel and concentrate everything on 124. It's torn and broken. 
So the inflammation is there because there is an injury. So you mm -hmm. have to address that torn and broken part. Derek, you're so funny. Derek says, every time he hears the both of us explain your treatment, putting all the pieces together reminds me of Columbo. Columbo is one of my favorite shows to watch. With. Yeah. And so I talk about Columbo in the sports course, because I always say you should be doing a lot of your assessment when the patient isn't watching. So I feel like Columbo when I say, oh, come with me this way. And then I'm watching them walk. That's when you're doing your gait assessment. Sometimes I will throw my pen at their feet to watch them pick it up. That's when I'm doing my squat assessment. So I feel like Columbo because you feel like the dumb detective sometimes, but you're gathering so much information that way. And Dana, empty cell syndrome, it's cerebral spinal fluid leak into the cell torsica, compressing the pituitary gland and causing atrophy of the anterior and posterior pituitary, coherent neurofeedback. Uh, yeah, I have a patient with an empty cell as well, and I am completely baffled by endocrinologists that refuse to test for the central signaling hormones that come out of the pituitary because this basal atrophy that you're talking about, if I'm thinking about it correctly, means you don't have pituitary signaling hormones. So FSH, LH, ACTH. So estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, growth hormone, all of those central signaling hormones come out of the pituitary. I'm not sure what neurofeedback is going to do. As far as I know, there's more than CSF fluid leaking into the cella tersica that causes empty cella, but I could be wrong because I've only seen like basically two in 30 years. And the one that I'm dealing with now, hers was from a pituitary tumor. And why would the spinal fluid leak into just the cella? Is it after a head injury? Yeah, what I'd really love to see for a patient with an empty cella is an endocrinologist that understands the pituitary instead of diabetes. Mm -hmm. I don't know, microcurrent might help. We have frequencies for the anterior and posterior pituitary, the anterior pituitary especially. Worth a try. The question is whether or not the pituitary is mechanically functional, right? If it's compressed enough, it's supposed to sit in this little cup called right. the cell in the in bone. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not there. Where is it? Like, where did it go? Yeah. And what does it do? So that one is on the very tippy edge of even my comfort level. Oh, Cynthia, bleeding, not 10 days post got injury was done. I did treat the nerve as well. I went right to the nerve, but with 40, I'll add others. Yay. I like it when we answer questions. Dana, I'm really sorry. And see, I love neurology because it's linear. Yeah. You poke it here and it goes up this pathway and it goes there and it crosses there and it goes up and it goes there and it's linear. Endocrinology is like you put in oranges and you get out uh, walnuts. It, everything gets turned into everything else in the liver. Your liver can turn estrogen into what or progesterone into anything it wants. But the signaling hormones coming out of the brain, it's just, the endocrine system is so complicated. It, it makes me a little crazy. Good luck. My alarm's going off. How is no. that? Yeah, it's... Is it really? Is this one of those days where, oh, there's Dana, 18 and 62. Did we answer everything before? I we... think we got it all done. Okay. There, you just Did talk more and the needs to sign up yay okay we have more questions we're back here next week and you can also do what maddie did is just email us and then that way we have stuff to bring to everyone's attention and chat about this 
this was great. This was like, it was fun. This was fun. It was. This was super I, exciting. Yay. Thanks everybody for coming. We, we are back next week. Yep. We're pretty consistent for the next little while, which is nice. Yeah. Do good, do good things. Yes, everybody. And we'll see you all next week. See you next week. Bye. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.